The World Health Organization, or WHO for short, has frequently referred to obesity as an epidemic of the modern world. And while frequently obesity and related illnesses like diabetes type 2 are referred to as first world diseases, the issue is in fact far more spread than that. Contrary to conventional wisdom, the obesity epidemic is not restricted to industrialized societies. In developing countries, it is estimated that over 115 million people suffer from obesity-related problems. Obesity has become such a global health problem that the WHO even coined the term globesity, which would actually be kind of funny if it weren't so tragic. And this problem is only increasing in magnitude. While in 1995 there were an estimated 200 million obese adults worldwide, only five years later, in the year 2000, there were already 300 million obese adults globally. As of 2016, we're at 650 million, and I don't want to know what the past years have done to that number. Now, before I get called out for fat shaming, let me clarify that I'm not talking about being chubby or having put on a few pounds in the most recent health crisis, which saw all of us confined in our houses with little else to do but eat. I am talking about a disease, one that causes many other health issues like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, stroke, and certain forms of cancer. And apart from the personal tragedies, there are also vast economic consequences of a population where around 40% of the adult population have that certain illness. In many countries, the health sector is a mix between the private and the public sector, meaning the state, companies, and private individuals are spending billions on preventable disease. In the US in 2013, the House Government Reform Committee held a hearing to examine the federal government's role in combating obesity. Quote, the facts are quite frankly frightening. Obesity-related diseases kill 400,000 Americans each year. Medical treatment of obesity and its more than two dozen associated conditions cost nearly $100 billion annually, according to some estimates. End quote. So clearly, obesity is of importance for many sectors, not just health, but also politically and economically speaking. One proposed way of combating the obesity epidemic has been to introduce a sugar tax. So, welcome to Rebel Economics and our new episode, where today we ask ourselves the question of what would really happen if a sugar tax were introduced? Can it really help to make the population healthier? The idea of a sugar tax is by far nothing new. If you have watched a video on do we buy our votes, you may recall me quickly mentioning it as one of the many taxes that the British Empire imposed on the American colonies. Of course, back then, the rationale was not to create healthier societies. However, in recent years, more and more countries have introduced a sugar tax of some kind. The most common implementation is a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, which 54 countries have already introduced. One of the earliest countries in recent history to introduce a sugar tax was Norway in 1992, though largely prompted by economic considerations. The Norwegian government, however, doubled down on this in 2018, when they raised the levy on chocolate and confectionery by 83%, meaning a tax of about $3.50 per kilo. Sugary drinks, including diet drinks containing artificial sweeteners, were also targeted, now being taxed at about 50 cent a liter. And while many of them may have been unhappy about this change, the sugar consumption in the Scandinavian country has fallen to a historic low of 24 kilograms per person per year, down from 43 kilograms in 2000, and decreasing by 27% in the past decade. In comparison to this, the United States Department of Agriculture reports that the average American consumes between 68 to 77 kilograms of sugar per year. And while Norway may be a positive example of the sugar tax, the problem never got as out of hand there as it did in many other countries. In Norway, only about 25% of adults are obese, whereas in Mexico, for example, the rate is at about 70%. So what are these countries to do? Mexico, for example, approved a sugar tax of 1 peso per liter, being roughly 5 US cents in 2014. But for some regions, that was not enough. In 2020, the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca has banned the sale of sugary drinks and high-calorie snack foods to children in order to combat the rising obesity rate in the underage population. This essentially puts sugary foods and beverages at the same level of restriction as alcohol and tobacco. 
Considering the popular comparison of the addictiveness of sugar to heroin, that actually makes a lot of sense. While that comparison may be an overstatement, it is true that sugar activates opiate receptors in our brain and affects the reward center. This in turn leads to compulsive behavior, despite negative consequences like weight gain, headaches, hormone imbalances, and more. So decreasing the amount of sugar we ingest is definitely a good thing. But is a sugar tax the way to go? Studies show varying results across different countries. In Europe, the UK is one of the countries that is struggling with obesity the most and has already introduced a tax against soft drinks containing added sugar since April 2018. The reason for the special targeting of sweetened beverages is, for one, because it is easier to implement than when it comes to food, both on a national level but also considering the common internal market of the EU, which back in 2018 still applied to the UK. Also, these sodas don't tend to include any further nutritional value, so their consumption is just additional sugar to our usual diet. And another reason why they are especially targeted is that as children and adolescents consume them. Meaning, by targeting sweetened drinks, you can influence the younger generations, where a decrease of obesity will help curb the long-term effects and have a more substantial and sustainable influence on the population. The British model has a tax on average of 10%, where those with more added sugar have to pay a higher tax compared to those who add less sugar. For beverages with 5 to 8 grams of sugar per liter, the equivalent of 9 American cents are taxed. Those with more than 8 grams, the tax is increased to 27 cents. In order for the consumers to not have to pay more, two tactics were followed by the producers. Either the recipe was altered to incorporate less sugar, so only the lesser tax would have to be paid. In fact, sugar in drinks sunk by 30%. The alternative to that is that the bottle simply got smaller, while the price stayed the same, essentially evening out the sugar tax by giving the consumers less of the product for their money. Now, you may ask if people chose to put up with either of the alternatives, of the altered beverages recipes and the limited amount. The answer is simple, yes. But while overall less sugar was consumed, more sweetened beverages were sold. So, when looking at this from the economic perspective of the companies, the sugar tax is actually a positive thing, and of course for the government as well. But from a health perspective, it is a pity to see that even more sugary drinks were consumed. And let's be clear, those are only the drinks with added sugars. Those with natural sugars like juice are not even included here. In that regard, it really is a double-edged sword, especially because to get the same sweet result with less sugar, sweeteners are used as substitute. While at the first glance that seems great because you get intense sweetness without all those calories, the truth is that we have no idea about the long-term effects of ingesting natural or artificial sweeters to such a high amount. While despite the rumors they have not scientifically been linked to cancer, there are other side effects like increased sugar cravings, increased appetite, and continuing to cause glucose intolerances similar to diabetes type 2. Studies continue to contradict each other, but it might be too early to herald sweeteners as the solution to the health issues of digesting too many sweetened products. But in order to assess the impact of the sugar tax, we cannot only look at the choices individuals make, but we also need to look at how the revenue from the sugar tax is used. In Mexico, this was a disappointing factor, where the money did not go into further preventative measures. In the first six months of the tax in the UK, about £153.8 million were paid for the tax, being the equivalent of $173.9 million. Revenue collected is used to help fund physical education activities in primary schools, the Healthy Pupils Capital Fund, and provide a fund boosting breakfast clubs in over 1,700 schools. The aim here, similar as in Mexico, is to especially target the children, so that they live a healthier life from the get-go, so fewer of them have the long-term health issues that many adults already experience. That being said, given the truly extreme extent the obesity epidemic is already taken, a lot more needs to be done than to tax sugary sodas. It's simply not enough. The amount of sugar in confectionery has increased by 23% over the past 30 years. 
So if you eat a bar of chocolate today, it is the equivalent of eating a bar and a quarter 30 years ago. And it's not just that. The main issue is that a lot of the added sugars are hidden in products where we really don't expect there to be any sugar. One common example is bread. If you make it at home, you most likely don't add any sugar. Or if you make bread with yeast, you would add about a teaspoon to feed the yeast bacteria and activate it, so your bread becomes nice and fluffy. But the same is not true for store-bought bread. In the US, according to the National Nutrient Database, one slice of commercially prepared white bread has 1.4 grams of sugar. Ireland, for example, has cracked down hard on sugar added to bread, stating that the sugar content of bread cannot exceed 2% of the weight of flour in the dough. In comparison, the Subway bread includes about 10% of sugar, meaning in Ireland, Subway sandwich bread is too sugar-laden to be technically defined as actual bread. This is just one of the many examples of why our sugar intake has soared, even if we try to eat relatively healthy. So where does that leave us? Despite the mixed results of taxing sweetened beverages, I do think more sugar taxes should be introduced to disincentivize the excessive consumption of candy, as well as to disincentivize producers to smuggle sugar into products where it is not necessary and quite frankly unwanted. Mexico has been quite successful in this, with statistics showing that a tax of about 10% on sugary products also result in about 10% decrease in their consumption. I think there is not a single person among us that can say that they couldn't do with little less sugar in their lives. I know that, at least for me, that is very true. Of course, the effectiveness of the sugar tax is also paired with educational programs spreading awareness about healthy diets, understanding cravings, and the effect that overeating sweetened products has on your body. Not just now, but also in the future. Ideally, the additional state revenue generated by the sugar tax should be used for such programs, as well as the healthcare system. Because even a decreased sugar consumption by 10% would still leave us far from becoming a healthy society. Obesity is an endemic problem that goes way beyond candy and needs to be looked at in a larger context. So going back to our question from the beginning of the video, can a sugar tax really help make the population healthier? My answer is yes, healthier I do believe, but healthy? No. At least that is my opinion based on the many things I researched on this topic. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments and as always, thank you so much for watching Rebel Economics. We appreciate your support, so if you enjoy our content, please like and subscribe. If you want more fun what-if thought experiments, check out our videos What If You Could Not Inherit Any Money or What If Everything Were Privatized. Thanks again for watching and see you next time.